is nice and informal. I was waiting for you. <laughs> it's so funny, you were talking about who's stronger, the Hulk or Superman. And I did this panel one time at the Egyptian Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. Dan Castaneda was with me, voice of Homer Simpson and a million other characters. And uh, the movie critic, I can't think of his name now. He's got the blue beard. Oh, Mole? Leonard Mole. Leonard Mole, yeah. Yeah, he was there and he was uh, talking, of, you know, talking to the panel and, and uh, you know, getting things going. And then Matt Granny was there. So we did this thing and it was really great. And then we were going to leave and we were in a crowd that was leaving the theater. And, you know, it's like, why not? You know, I don't need a special bulletproof limousine or any crap. And so we're going out and there's this voice from the back. It's this shrieky, high little voice, and he's screaming at Dan Castellaneta. He's like going, why did they, in the German episode, the version where you were supposed to be playing the character, they, you didn't do it, it wasn't you. They, they, they put your name there, but it wasn't you. Why? You know, and he goes, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. German episode. So, but the kid kept bugging us and coming, following, you know, why? <laughs> and, uh, and I've run into that guy in another form. Uh, he came up and he says, he, he's got like a leather jacket or some kind of jacket with a zillion buttons on it. And there he was like, you know, he just wanted to ask a question. And he came up. And it was like, Okay, who, uh, who would win in a fight with, uh, if the powder toast man got into a fight with the Joker, who would win? And I, and I went, do you write? Yeah. Do you, um, draw? Yeah. Well, why don't you, you know, just draw your own thing and put some words to it and, and everything. And he's like, no, I want you to tell me. <laughs> You know, it was like he had to have it that way. I think like a week earlier he was saying, I'm going to say those things and I better get the right answer that I want or I'm going to short circuit. <laughs> he was. He was like, eh, eh, do it myself. What is that supposed to mean? Huh? <laughs> but you know what? He'll probably be one of those nuts that like goes and does it and comes up with a character that becomes world famous. And uh, that's what I'm hoping for, really. I'm not really making fun of him. I, don't know. I was... I was basically that kid, except there was no one to bother. <laughs> there was nobody to bother. There was no celebrities or, or people that I idolized. They weren't going to come by your house or be at the stage downtown. Um, but I was, uh, I didn't care about much of anything that anybody else cared about. Um, there was three channels when I was growing up. And there was a desperation I hope I can make myself clear on this. There was a desperation that me and guys like me had that we're going to become performers uh, or voice people or whatever, that what you were watching might be the coolest thing you ever saw in your whole life and it was going to be gone in nine minutes and you'll never see it again. So we just sucked every proton and every, you know, pixel out of the television set, every bit of sound, uh, and try to absorb it that fast because you would die when it was over. It's like, I'm never going to see that again. So then the object was to try to recreate it for somebody else. Mm. You know, like, they, hey, did you see this thing the other night? There was a spy show on and the guy was so cool. He was with women and he had a gun and he was a tuxedo. And he goes, no, I didn't see it. Here, let me show you. And I would do the whole routine that I saw on TV. I don't know how I memorized it. But um, that was the desperation to recreate something that you thought was cool. And eventually, you didn't know it then, but eventually you would be the person that would uh, generate something cool that other people would be inspired by. So, you know, that's why I never played it small. I always played it loud and crazy because um, you can never inspire anybody else if you just play it small and you don't show up and you don't talk to people. Because uh, so many people want to know, especially now. Everybody, you know, everybody asks me, like, voiceover, voiceover. I said, yeah, well, you got to go be a celebrity first. You know, that's all they want in, the, in those big movies. And to me, that's not, that's not art. It's not, you know, it's not bringing anything to the table if you show up and you are who, who and exactly what you are in real life and when you do roles. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, 
you know, the, they, they want you to come in, the producers, and they go, oh, we got this bar of lead on the table. Um, do you think you can turn it into gold before you leave? That's your job. <laughs> okay, cool. And you do it because that's what you were meant to do. You, you, you find something hopefully unique or different or some kind of twist to it and blows those guys away. When a celebrity comes in and they go, see that lead bar? We need you to turn it into gold. And they take $20 million and they leave the room and it's still a lead bar. There's no alchemy. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's no alchemy. That's what I thought art was. My heroes weren't celebrities. You know, I, hate, I don't know if I sound disappointing when I say that. I just never cared about celebrities. My, my heroes were Da Vinci and, you know, the great painters and the sculptors. And, and as far as voice people go, they were Mel Blanc. Jean Ferre, Don Messick, Dawes Butler, uh, all of them were so uh, unbelievable to me. I couldn't believe that they actually existed. You know, they only lived in this world. And, uh, and then, if you're lucky enough, later on in life, you get to meet some of them. And, and it's so funny, I, I was shaking when I, met one, when I met Mel Blanc. I was like, I said, this is ridiculous. I don't have any kind of physical problems and I can't even hold a pen in my hand. <laughs> You know, and uh, he signed something for me. I went to see a, a lecture that he did, a voice and slideshow at an old uh, university in Worcester. And at the end of it, he said, so if anybody wants any autographs, uh, you want to make a line over here? And, uh, and I burst out of my seat like an uncontrollable, <laughs> wild, rabid, spastic dog. <laughs> and, and I was body slamming little kids. <laughs> I was checking them like it was a hockey game. Get out of my way, you little bastards. And, and then Mel Blanc yelled at me. <laughs> yeah, he yelled at me. He said, could you let the little kids go first, please? No. <laughs> but I did meet him and I was like, it was surreal. It was surreal. I mean, the things you think about when you meet somebody that you, you absolutely idolized. Um, I, he was sitting and I was standing up and I, I found myself looking down his ear. I said, I'm looking down Mel Blanc's ear. <laughs> I don't know, do you, you ever get weird abstract thoughts like that? Like you're only looking for periphery and that's good enough for you? Like, even that, it's cool. Um, because if I thought of all the voices that went down that ear and what inspired him and how it came out or how he percolated it or whatever. And, uh, you know, I met a lot of my heroes. I was a guitar player. I wanted to be a musician before I wanted to be anything. And uh, one of my heroes was Les Paul. And I met him and I met a huge hero of mine, uh, Jeff Beck, guitar player. And uh, it was killing me. I, I almost died when... Uh, Max Weinberg from Conan O'Brien's show introduced me to him at Jones Beach in New York, the Coca-Cola concert venue. And I said, we're not going to get back there to see him. And I run into Max, he goes, Billy, how you doing? And he knew me because I was a guest on the show once. And he said, uh, are you going back to say hi to Jeff? I go, hardly. You know, they give you this, they give you this all access phony pass, like you can go anywhere. And you find out you can go anywhere within six feet. <laughs> And that's backstage. There's a zillion backstages. You know, and, you, and then finally he said, well, come on, I'll take you back there. And I was like, I don't, this is the moment of truth. I'm going to run into this guy. Are my knees going to collapse or what? These are the only kind of celebrities I cared about. They were artists, you know. I don't want to meet Ed Asner. I mean, you think he's cool and everything, but I'm like, my knees aren't going to buckle. <laughs> Maybe they would. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know here what I'm... How long am I going to be here today in, in this room? Uh, we've got the room for another uh, 35, 40 minutes. We do? Okay. Yeah, uh, so it's enough time to oh, yeah, well, we can babble you. about oh, stuff. Yeah, right. well, I figured you'd babble for a while and then we could take some questions. And, okay. Yeah, I mean, so no, no. Carry on. Like okay. the way you think. Circle gets the square. <laughs> <laughs> like the way you play the game. Yeah, no, because I tell you what, I mean, I was sitting up here and I'm like, wow, you know, I mean, just, I, I can only imagine what it must have been like meeting Mel Blanc. Oh. I mean, you know, that's, and I, and I kind of wanted to ask you about it, but I was like, well, no, I, he's on a roll. <laughs> so I, don't I can to... give you, I can give you uh, some sort of example. The only one I can think of is, uh, oh gosh, uh, the painting. It's up above um, in the chapel. The Sistine Chapel? Yes. Oh, okay. It's like uh, the creation, is yes. it? Mm -hmm. And God is 
reaching down, <laughs> pointing his finger, and there's this little twerp on the ground. <laughs> Human. And he's extending his, his finger because he's, he wants to bridge that differential so he can be like God. And I said, and that sums it up, you know. It's like, I was this little twerp. Please, somebody skyhook me the fuck out of here. I don't like it here. I took a wrong turn and wound up on Earth. <laughs> but I tell you, the thing is, it's so amazing for me to, I mean, because you are a phenomenal talent. Oh, I mean, thank I think, you. I think everybody in here is a talent. I always appreciate that. Yeah. No, but but so to hear you talking about somebody like that, I mean, that's like, because as far as I'm concerned, I mean, you know, it's like, all right, I mean, you know, yeah, Mel Blanc is, you know, he's, but you're not, you're not, it's, it's, you're not that far from there. <laughs> well, I'm honored that you would say that. Um, a lot of people don't know who he is, but I think it, it's not an age thing. I think if you're, if you guys, you know, I mean, I was a geek, if that's what you want to call it, if it's an insult or a compliment, I don't know anymore. Um, suddenly there's all sorts of geeks that weren't geeks before conventions, you know? <laughs> like, you know, the kid who used to beat me up was probably going to conventions, you know? It's like with his kids, can we get a picture of you? You know, it's like, yeah, I wasn't too important back then. But you always find a way to get even, and, and one of the bullies that bothered me he was, everything about him was pointy. You know, he was this whitey, whitey little white bread guy that was a bully. <laughs> he was a bully, and he was a coward. It was all the classic things that you don't know when you're a kid. You don't know why they're doing that. You think that they have some sort of power, but it never dawns on you that they're more scared of you, basically. Otherwise, they wouldn't have struck out at you. You were a threat of some sort. And I, it took me forever to understand that, you know, and so there was this kid, I did a show called Doug on Nickelodeon. Yeah. You know, I was a painfully average 11 and a half year old, and um, this is my dog Porkchop. <laughs> and I got a question on Patty Mayonnaise. Wow. I write in my diary every day about her. And Roger, is this total pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah, say it to my face, loser. Wait a minute, you're getting too close. Don't say it to my face, loser. <laughs> you know, and it's like, he was based on the kid who used to bother me. He was pointy, everything about him was pointy. His nose came to a point, his hair came to a point, his shoes came to a point. <laughs> he, was like, he was like the, the mosquitoes that get in the tent, you know. <laughs> they're gonna bother you forever. Get in your ear. Um, but that was my own little satisfaction to, to swipe at him and every other cookie cutter bully I ever met in my life, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, now, I have to ask you, mm -hmm. um, you know, because uh, particularly knowing how you feel about, you know, Mel Blanc and his work, mm -hmm. um, when you had the opportunity to voice some of those characters in uh, Space Jam, what was, what was that like? It was, um, it was very surreal. Um, everyone in the world auditioned for it. Everybody. Oh, of course. And uh, and I was working on the Howard Stern show at the time. And oh wow, you like that? <laughs> <laughs> Baba Bowie. What's Robin Quivers like? I'm gonna ask him what he really thinks of Mark Shot. <laughs> you know what? We we did all that stuff to have fun, but a lot of it was to point up the grotesqueness of racism because we touched on those subjects. You can't pretend they don't exist, but you can't pretend that people that talk like her don't exist. You have to know that that's going on out there. You know, he's black. He scares me. I don't know. You know what? You know what's what's wrong with the president? I don't know. There's something about him. Yeah, you know what's about him. <laughs> you know, and it's not very honest, or or it's it's almost like hidden cowardly stuff. And we were like stirring up the scab, you know, ripping it off. And it's like, let's go, let's go, let's talk about stuff. And the best way to talk about anything was to make fun of it. And, and show how absurd that stuff is. How absurd how words can mean nothing if they, you know, if you took, if you took Rush Limbaugh and you take him seriously, all you gotta do to get out of that is pretend it's a, it's a four-year-old girl saying what he's saying. <laughs> and you go, this shit ain't shit. <laughs> I'd rather have a four-year-old. Man, she should do a show. 